Welcome to another exciting select board meeting for the town of Waterbury. I'll call a meeting to order on Monday, August 6th. Uh, unless there's any changes or additions to the agenda. We have one addition. Okay. Um, the listers have um, sent a letter with regard to some necessary changes to the grant list. Uh, Arizona missions. Sorry. So we need to get that on the agenda. Is it something relatively short, or do we want to put it we can put down it in the manager's we can items? Put it on the manager's okay. Items. Yeah, it's short, but we can still put it on the manager's items. Okay then. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the change. I'll second that. Yep. No further discussion there. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items. All aye. there is is the minutes for the July 30th meeting. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda items as listed. I'll second that. Okay. And moving on quickly, all those in favor say aye. 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 Public, anybody here that wishes to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll move right on to 708. Uh, resubmission of the planning grant and feasibility study for community center, and that has to be Barb Fire. <laughs> in France. In France. <laughs> okay. So this is a redo of the planning grant for the feasibility study for the community center that we got turned down on uh, back in the end of June when they made their decision. Um, Steve Lott's speech went to the uh, board meeting where they discussed all the applications that were in. They had over $4 million worth of requests and only over a little bit over $2 million worth of funding for both implementation grants and planning grants. Um, so because ours was not time sensitive, they put it on the back burner and notified us that we did not get it in that round, but they suggested strongly that we reapply with the same grant application um, for this next round. <clears throat> so the only things that need to be done for this is just a recommitment on your behalf um, uh, and signing a resolution that yes, we're resubmitting the grant application and to reconfirm that the um, match is still the same as it was under the other conditions. Um, so we've also met, um, you know Nick, um, who's Deb Fowler's replacement, and Karen Evan is also, we're all working together on this with the Senior Center, the Recreation Department, and Meals on Wheels, and the Children's Room, because all of those organizations are cramped for space. And that's why we were, um, they're all looking at putting together a feasibility study to figure out, you know, what kind of space can be best utilized by everybody um, going forward. Board have anything to discuss? So basically it's the same thing, it's just. It's exactly the same <clears throat> application. We just needed to get a reconfirmation from you yeah. um, to move forward. I'll make a motion to resubmit the planning grant. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, in, all against? Nay? I stick to my guns. Okay. Um, thank you. Carla has the original resolution and she needs to notarize it after you sign it. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Barb. Yep. Okay, while well, you guys are signing that, I guess we can move forward. 
the next item, which is update on the railroad bridge artwork and road closure during installation. Karen. Uh, I really apologize. I'm so swamped that I realized I hadn't written a letter, so I drafted it at home. It has no letterhead on it, but at least um, I've got a couple copies which I'll share with you. Um, but it's been busy. <laughs> So uh, you are aware, I hope, of the Waterway Rail Art Project and the sculpture um, that we commissioned to put on the railroad uh, bridge down here. Uh, Barb, myself, and Teresa are the project leaders. And uh, this project's been going on, at this point, a year and a half, maybe 18 months. Um, initial conversations, probably uh, two years. and. Um, we're ready to install the sculpture. Uh, it is uh, ready to be installed on Sunday, August 26th. Our goal is to install it um, in the morning. We're trying to figure out when is the least impact uh, to traffic. And this letter I just prepared for you is a request to close the road, Route 100, from basically the rotary. You can get around the rotary to the other side of the bridge, to Dac Row, um, where we would have, we will hire traffic control and we will reroute traffic from the rotary up Union Street. So southbound traffic would go up Union Street and down uh, Stowe Street and uh, northbound traffic, um, we probably have some signs uh, for up Stowe Street and then they can come down Union or keep going. Um, we don't know how long it will go. I've asked from 7 p. Oh, I wrote 7 p.m. and that's wrong. 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, my guess is we'll start about 8 o'clock. Uh, the artist needs to rent a lift, and the only physical way to put this up is to park that lift in the middle of the traffic. <laughs> um, we have. Um, we have signed a la railroad license agreement with the New England Central Railroad to perform this work. Uh, we have acquired all of the insurances that they require uh, to uh, have in order to do this work. Uh, we are responsible for traffic control on the road. They actually will provide flaggers for the, um, the railroad. Um, the artist will rent the lift. He has two volunteers that are working with him. RW has purchased medical and accident insurance to cover all three of them during the installation. Uh, we, um, we are required to, he's required to have railroad worker training, wear personal protective equipment. We have quite literally dotted our T's, well, crossed our T's and <laughs> dotted our I's to make sure this project um, is uh, we're doing it in a responsible manner. Uh, the only thing that could slip us up is if it was to be a seriously rainy day and we haven't really thought, we just don't plan on it. Um, <laughs> but if it does, we would delay the project, the installation to another Sunday morning. We would not do it on Labor Day. Um, that would just not be fair. Um, but we figured all everything's in place to do the project on the 26th. Um, and we, I'm asking your permission to close the road. Uh, we've got, um, what was that? We plan on a celebration, uh, but it will not be the day of installation. So the celebration will not necessarily happen at the location. Um, it may happen at DAC Row where people might be able to walk and see it. We haven't planned that a celebration, but we're very cognizant this is literally a major in intersection in traffic, um, and we don't want to uh, affect that. So, my, anybody have any questions? And I also, in my letter, says I'd be happy to provide a copy of the license agreement with the railroad to the select board or to Bill so that you have a copy of those, that material for yourself. So I have to ask, because I was off in some other land there. Um, are you closing off Union Street as well? You're not? OK. So they'll be able to scoot through the That's exactly it. Part, part. It's being installed on the bridge facing the railroad, facing the roundabout. So it's literally just the area underneath the bridge that we need access to. And the best thing to do is anyone would just drive up Union Street. 
and being a Sunday, it's... A Sunday morning, my hope is that's the lowest traffic. Right. I think that's yeah. what our assumption was. We would, and doing it first thing in the morning instead of later in the afternoon, you know, we're just trying to um, choose the best time to do this. Friday afternoons. Um, 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> For a second, I thought you were saying no. If you already mentioned it, yep. does AOT have to be involved at all? No. Or they do don't have to, I don't believe they have to be involved. Do, are they involved when you close, well, you don't close Main Street. Um, for the Arts Fest, I'm just trying to think. That's a good question. You I know, I plan on, we'll, we will hire sheriffs and we'll talk to the state, the, the police officers in, um, in town. I'll check. Um, you want to check on the V-Chain? Sure. <clears throat> yep. Um, you don't have that answer, Mr. Woodruff? I don't, but if I would say that if you choose to go the route of shutting Main Street down, Union Street, um, to allow two-way traffic, you can be parked legally and it can be a one-lane yeah. on Union yeah. Street. So beforehand, some car people would have to be instructed and there would have to be some cones so people can't park certain areas of Union Street because, as I said, legally parking is one lane. Yeah, I think you really should um, try to have signs that indicate if you're if you're trying to go Route 100 North, mm -hmm. continue up Snow Street, right. and only send people northbound on Union Street that are trying to get to Route 2, even people trying to get to the interstate can go up Stowe Street and get on yes. the interstate. So interstate and Route 100 North. At the traffic light intersection is the best bet. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, at Union Street, I guess. I mean, you're going to have to direct people up Stowe Street anyway. But at Union Street, you should say Route 2 West mm -hmm. or the roundabout mm -hmm. up Union Street and then Route 100 North or the interstate go up Stone Street. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll have to have some type of signage or something off Winooski Street as well, right? Because you don't want them turning. Yes, yes. And then uh, right point. top of Bank Hill. Yep, yep. yep. Winooski Street. Um, the installation date uh, was decided like on Thursday afternoon and so we just went into full gear to figure this out. So uh, I appreciate Winooski turn yeah. uh, right. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll work on the signage. Maybe the AOT yeah. can help us with some of that. Um, and we'll, well, being a Sunday recreation field, access to that. Um, so if you prevent coming this way from Winooski Street, unless well, I mean, unless somebody's going to the ball field, they can can they they can get in the back way and get in the ball field because you can't get under the bridge. If you had somebody, if you're going to the ball field, you got to go up the street and back down Main Street. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't restrict people from coming down North Main in order to get to homes or. Or right. businesses right. or anything. Right. Well, you're just going to have to plan the right. logistics. So you're going to have a flag person there who can intercept people and talk to people, yep. you know, trying to get to the ball field. Yes. Because there is it's another access. The weekend of the men's no. softball. No. Game, is it? Oh, gosh. But also, when we close down the Stowe Street Bridge up there for two hours to do a little concrete work, all of a sudden, an oversized truck comes. His permit tells him, you know, he has to travel Stowe Street to get to coffee roasters, you know. And I know when they did the Main Street Bridge repair, you know, they had to keep an 11 foot wide lane or 12 foot wide lane for oversized trucks that are, were not allowed to travel various other routes. So, do they come down on Sunday mornings? I don't know. We didn't. Yeah, it was our luck that the two hours we had the bridge closed. The guy gave, <laughs> he, he gave him a better route to get there, and he said, "My permit says I must travel this route. Oh my goodness! This is the route I'm traveling." No so. kidding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, well, what I'm I'm happy to. Um, we have another committee meeting coming up, and we can, we will we will work out all the logistics, and I'm happy to. Um, share them with Bill so you, and, you know, know exactly what we've, how we've decided to resolve these 
the yeah, situation? I think the board should approve it um, conditioned upon right, the logistics being worked out with everyone that we have to work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like a yeah. member of the public would like to speak. I'm, I'm recusing myself when I have some comments. Um, I don't know if this thing turned off for me. Um, for her, the businesses downtown, at least the restaurants, August is the busiest month for us. So Sunday morning, anyone who's open for lunch since you're going to three, that's actually a really busy time this time of year. So my question is why did you choose to do it in August and not in a slower time of season, especially when this is our bread and butter season? Well, honestly, um, we were hoping to get it done in July, and the project took longer than we expected. Um, it's a grant deadline. Our too, grant has a deadline. Um, that is the deadline? December 31st. So we could put it off. Our artist is um, cannot store the sculpture, uh, and so we were aiming for as soon, you know, as soon as we can. I picked the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. as a outside limit I think this will be done probably within three to four hours that's what he's projecting uh, so my hope is that we'll be done you know as complicated as this project has been the hanging system is actually pretty logistically easy and he just needs to lift each piece up and hook them together and screw some bolts in and cross our fingers um, <laughs> So I don't think it's going to take the amount of time I have listed here. I've just asked for a wide swath of time in order to just uh, be safe. I could, we could do it. I don't you know. I mean, we knew Labor Day was not a good idea, and then going into September, I think we just start landing into fall foliage, and I was really worried about that time. And then after Columbus Day, and then it starts getting colder. And There's cold and weather dependent. So our goal is to get this up as soon as we could, and at the moment we can't do it the weekend before the 26th because we're still finalizing the license agreement with the railroad. Yeah, I think the only thing I would ask is just making sure there's very clear signage on how to find the downtown yes. for all the businesses that rely on that. You know how much we care about that, so we'll make sure. I would ask whether there was going to need to be light adjustments at Stowe Street and Blush Hill, whether the traffic lights need to be adjusted if we're putting all the volume heading north that way, and I don't know the answer. I'm just, you know, we, we could hire a sheriff to manage that. Um, the, you know, the good news is the project has the funds to pay for what we need to make sure this goes really smoothly, so. We I, I guess I would have the question about how heavy the traffic flow is really on Sunday morning. And, and if, in fact, they can get in that four-hour-ish window and everything, the potential of having it done by noon is probably pretty good. Um, almost any other day, though, Monday through Friday, there's just so much traffic, and Saturday is probably one of those heavy traffic times as well. You know, and we just really shouldn't do it late afternoon or evening. Um, you know, the sculpture will be lit, ultimately. It's going to be really quite spectacular, but I have just thought the Sunday morning was our best yeah. option in terms of impact. And um, the, you know, just to answer Mark's other question about why we wanted it done, we also quite honestly felt early on in this project thought Main Street reconstruction was going to start August, September, and we wanted this up before the Main Street reconstruction. That got put away, put off. <laughs> But that was the other deadline in our minds of making sure this was done before that got, that work started. So, so we always sort of had August 31st as a deadline in our mind. Yeah, I guess my one comment is there is there's after Labor Day before foliage is a window that's quite a bit slower than August, and then after foliage, which I know it's cold, but it's not typically snowing then that's a pretty slow season for any of the businesses downtown so in terms of impact it would be significant less impact but it would also probably be nice to have this up for foliage so it's mm -hmm. gonna be spectacular <laughs> okay. okay okay so uh taking bill's cue um i would make a motion that we 
approve this request contingent upon um, the more detailed planning on, on the traffic control uh, aspect of it. Mr. Fish? I'll second that. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All the board members sitting up front? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. William? Okay. Um, back a couple of months ago, we had some visitors uh, who brought to the board's attention concerns about speeding uh, up in Water Center, a couple of roads in particular. Uh, mainly between the, the green um, and the post office, maybe Dr. Brenner's. Um, there was some discussion at that meeting by the select board about different things that we might be able to do. Uh, around the same time, uh, we reported to you that we had the opportunity uh, to work with the state on, uh, what is it, a rural road? High risk rural road high-risk rural road um, uh, study that had been done with some recommendations. Uh, and this study basically encompasses the length of Guptal Road from right. Route 100 up to the, up to the Green in Waterbury Center. Um, and there was talk at that meeting about potentially uh, some flashing speed signs. So um, we backed off a little bit on the rural road study and involved the folks uh, from the state with your questions. And one of the things that um, they told us was that these uh, feedback flashing speed signs that, that uh, display um, how fast you're going could be part of the project, but there needed to be a speed study done. So we had the Regional Planning Commission put some tube counters up there and Bill is here to uh, share with us the results of that and make some recommendations. Steve Watspeech also was involved in this, but Steve's on vacation this week, so Bill's coming. All right, so as Bill mentioned, um, between May 25th and June 8th, Central Vermont Regional Planning put the two counters right basically at the post office uh, in Waterbury Center. Um, the purpose being, as Bill said, to see whether these radar flashing speed signs would be eligible as part of this high-risk rural road project. Um, so I have a, the data that came from that report and the most valuable thing is the summary um, of what happened up there. As you may or may not know, the speed limit is 25 miles per hour in that section. Um, right there and we'll, we'll, we could play Jeopardy and I can ask you what you think the average <laughs> speed was up there. Um, but, um, it was a little over 25. I'm over 25. Think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, what they usually go for a lot of these speed studies is the 85th percentile for the speed. And we're talking in that area up there, we're talking, you know, 38 miles an hour, 37 miles an hour, depending mm -hmm. northbound or southbound. Um, you know, a mean average speed of 32 miles an hour. So, again, well over the 25, which I don't think is surprising mm -hmm. to anybody who's, who's traveled the road. Um, the average traffic count up there, um, both northbound and southbound, is over 2,200 cars a day. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of traffic. Yeah. But that was during 100 construction too, wasn't it? It was, but we're not talking school time either. So, yeah, uh, I would probably just ramp up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I said, the, the speed in car counter gave us data, which I think is pretty typical of what happens up there on the road. Um, the engineer for the V-Trans said because the speed is more than three miles per hour over the 25 that this radar speed sign would be eligible as part of this high-risk rural road. 
so the steps we went through with regional planning, getting that in there, um, it makes it look like this. If we, if you would choose to have one of those there, it would be it, the the project cost would be covered by the federal government. Each direction. I believe each direction. Yeah. Sweet. So. Um, some of the other recommendations, you know, the signage and all that that goes with the rural program, I think are all pretty straightforward and they approve the, they clean up some of the old signs, the truck entering, the, you know, horse, or on, people on horseback, um, some of that stuff, um, you know, mm -hmm. makes the road a little safer. We get some arrows, chevrons on corners and, you know, various things like that. So. Is it solar or hardware? Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just <clears throat> wondering. It. Uh, my recollection from our earlier conversation was that this had the potential to be a two plus year project to get any of this to happen. Do we have a better sense of timing? No, I, I would say that's probably accurate. Um, <clears throat> I will say, I think the most important thing I was up there today and at Mrs. Guyatt's, Henry at a Guyatt's house right there. Uh, our trooper was sitting there. So I think that's probably doing as much, if not more, than what these signs are going to amount to. But I'm going to say, did he have any luck? He's, he's been good. He, uh, I've never really seen anybody sit in Mrs. Guyette's driveway there, but that's where he was. And um, I won't throw names out, but yeah, a woman who's been noted to go fast down through there was going reasonable. So, um, yeah. And the, I've seen him on further down up the road. So, I, like I said, I think the trooper's doing the job. Um, you know. But it's a two year before these would be installed because, I mean, we approved that spend, and I think the public's expecting us to put something in place soon. Well, I, two I, years. I can push them, but, you know. Um, well, it's probably going to be next year. Right? Yes, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's two years from now. I don't think it's no. necessarily going to be 2020. So, you, so you're thinking 2019? I would think so. I, uh, mean, I, I know that we said put them in. Um, I think Bill's point about the state trooper being out there is a reasonable one. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, if we can get those in as part of this project, I think it's a it's a reasonable thing. Uh, the public, I hope, will appreciate the fact that we've taken some initiative. We heard their concerns. We had this rural road project kind of ready to go, and we were able to, you know, work with the state and uh, get them to delay a little bit to allow us to get this study done. So, I, I, I would recommend that we that we wait as opposed to spend. I mean, I don't remember, remember how much the ones on Stowe Street cost? Yeah, Six, seven thousand. I was gonna say, I thought it was around seven grand, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I would echo Bill's. I, I think, I mean, the state guys been after us and after us to sign this agreement, which I think we've had on the table for a while, but we waited on the speed study, we waited, you know. Um, and there's no telling, but I would guess next year would be the, and, and next year, we're looking at the prospect of uh, paving up through there, too. Is that? Well, not sure yet. Yeah. I mean, we're hoping to do Loomis Hill next year. Yeah. Okay. We'll be doing some culverts this year and some bridge work up through there. Um, it's, close, it's closer to being paved than not yeah. being paved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, I was just wondering about the timing with stuff. So I may have missed that there when you said wait, wait on wait on signing the agreement or no I, no, no <coughs> we waited on signing the agreement until oh. we got this speed study done so we could incorporate the so i would that. like the board to authorize me to sign this tonight okay and i would also i mean i, I understand what mark is saying but i think waiting until the you know next year sometime to put up these feedback signs and saving the seven thousand dollars, I think that's the way we should do it. The, um, the, the project pay for this. Well, the story. other piece, and and uh, Bill mentioned it, is now we actually have a police presence right. in yeah. the area. Well, um, my yeah, yeah. So my, to that to, to that effect, my comment is, once these signs are up, they may not 
the problem may already be solved, you know. Or, well, well to to some some degree. I think these will help. And uh, the signs I, definitely do work. Yeah, you can um, see it even on Stowe Street. Now. Yeah, yeah, and there yeah. seems to be no real maintenance. We haven't had any maintenance issues with the Stowe Street ones. So a solar solar radar feedback sign. Um, I think waiting for it to happen would be a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the interim, I had uh, um, someone who lives along Guptill Road uh, suggested um, with respect to the 40 mile an hour zone through there, uh, the only signage for 40 when you turn it off from 100 is the one right there by the Route 100 intersection. And mm -hmm. there, there is no 40 mile an hour sign either direction when you come off from Neyland Flats um, and just Having that additional signage, I think it's included in this package. Yeah, I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 As you come off Neyland, there will be one north, one south. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so, do we have the ability to move this flashing sign if we feel like up by the town shed it's, or is it going to stay there? If up well, by the town shed, if if we feel that it could be used down. They got the road further. I mean, is, I'm assuming zero. we'll mount it reasonably into a sleeve, or but maybe having the ability to move it might not be a bad option if since it will be solar. Um, although I think the requirement says I think we're going to have to put it where they okay. So it's a fixed it, unit then. It's because Stowe, as you go out of Stowe, they've got the one yeah. that's kind of and that, that moved. Yeah, I, I think the requirement. Yeah, yeah, so they have the ability to. The requirement from the Fed says we will maintain it according to the plan. Okay. And I think I also think that's the critical place. Um, the forty mile an hour zone. If they end up going forty six through there, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's it's nowhere near as heavily congested and nowhere near as many yeah. kids and everything else. Foot traffic. Yeah. And, and then we have the trooper. And, and you know, hopefully, they give a few tickets where it gets out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that we have to. The, when I sign this agreement, it's saying that you're going to maintain the signs where they've told you to put them. That's exactly what it says. Okay. Yeah. And and also, it's I think it's worthwhile to wait for the signs to be put in by then because they will make sure that they're all compatible with the MUT CD mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah. They'll be properly reflective, and they'll be the right size, and all oh that. And what's the time period that these signs are in there? In perpetuity, or yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It uh, the the package that was uh, uh, really designed to improve the safety on uh, higher risk uh, rural roads, and there there are a number around that uh, that are like that that. Lack adequate signage, uh, difficult to enforce. This will provide a standardized package, which not only provides better awareness, it also improves the ability to enforce any of the, the violations there. So back to the state police question for you, Mark. Um, if they're patrolling like up there by Mrs. Guyatt's place, and somebody's doing eight miles over, is there a has the town set a Kind of a limit as to what it's the trooper officer discretion. Yeah. I see. The yeah. select board, the select board can only, um, you know, you're supposed to post speed limits in accordance with a speed study that has been done. We we've done that years ago. The ordinance that we that you adopted references that study, and that's really the extent of the town's ability to do anything. And then it's up to the enforcement officers. And I don't know if the, you know, the station commander gives a, a limit, but in my experience, at least with the municipal department, police officers typically had their own kind of, you know, I'm gonna give people Ten miles of this amount or that amount. And sometimes it would depend on what the speed limit is. Because mm -hmm. I used to, I remember talking to the, to the village police and saying, you know, if somebody's going 10 miles an hour and it's a 25 mile an hour limit, they're going 30% faster than the speed mm -hmm. limit. If they go 10 miles an hour over on the interstate, yeah. it's only one sixth over, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I didn't know if there was a set 
no. no. Uh, overage based on either the amount of the ticket fine or I was always under the understanding that the state police wouldn't pick you up unless you were X amount of miles over because it wasn't worth it, worth it financially for them to to pull you over. But that's just must be that's. Yeah, it's it, it's officer discretion, and usually there's some of that that factors in. And the other piece is um, if you're sitting there, as as uh, Bill mentioned, and somebody goes by and they get pulled over and stopped and you know whether they get a ticket or not everybody that's going by is seeing that oh, yeah. they're stopped and yeah, yeah. yeah so it has a has an educational benefit to it sometimes a ticket depends upon the attitude of the driver <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> God talks to them. Yeah. I, my last one was i was 16 miles per hour over and i got off okay. my daughter I say this one. It's <laughs> 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 Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one quick question on so um, and Chris you might be interested in this um, once we put in expensive infrastructure like this it's gonna have a lifespan do these once they've approved this say we have an issue with it or it just literally hits the end of life is there another is there ability to continue to get these paid for or do we just get it one time and then in the future we have to decide whether or not we want to replace it Pretty much, it's pretty much is a one-time grant. Um, you know, when we would get grants for radar guns, or grants for uh, vests for police officers, or even back in the day when we got money to actually hire an officer, after the three-year period was up, it was your responsibility yeah. to pay for that. Um, these have fairly long life expectancies. Uh, you know the digital equipment for the most part. There's not really any moving parts. It's just the readout. I think they can be, if something goes wrong with them, they can be repaired by, you know, plugging something out mm -hmm. and plugging something else in. Um, and I, I think that in the grand scheme of things, while we someday might have to pay for a complete replacement, the several thousand dollars that it will cost will not be a budget breaker and you know we can kind of incorporate it into our planning process. Do you want a motion for your signature? I would appreciate that, yeah. And the motion is to sign the authorize me to sign the what is it, rural roads? High risk rural road project for town highway number one <coughs> Bethel Road. So moved. I'll Say second that. High-risk rural road project for town highway number one, Guptill Road. Thank you. You've got to say that three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Matera seconded it. Yes. I'll, I'll just, for further discussion, I, the one comment is, is I hope we can really try to get this in for next year just because we yeah. have some concerns, and yeah. I do agree that the police department is a big help, but I'd like to see it get Yeah, we'll, we'll work with them, and we'll lobby the best we can. To, I mean, in, in essence, this, this has got a 2015 date on it is when the project kind of started. So I think just awaiting Bill's signature, hopefully, gets it. Moving along. That's the final piece. Was that uh, one for Stowe Street, too? Yes. Yeah. Have we approved that one yet? Not. Well, I'd have to check. Um, okay. You showed both of them to both bodies previously, so but I don't I don't recall. I don't recall. There were no issues on Stowe Street. There a lot of moving, just moving of signs, kind mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Uh, um, if you don't mind, rather than have to come back and present again, there was really there was nothing on Stowe Street that I really remember. A lot of it was wording changes, different signs, as in whether it says school zone, now it's a picture of a person and yep. a child, or whatever yep. the And we're gonna model. change the flashing signs to something different. Yeah, yeah. Do we need to modify the motion for Stowe Street and Guptill? You can make a separate motion. Okay. To approve it, authorize me to approve the Stowe Street one. Okay. If you're comfortable doing that. If not, we can bring yep. it to the next meeting. Yep. No, I'll, I'll make the motion that we authorize you to approve the um, Stowe Street um, signage package. I'll second. 
I don't think we said yes to the first one, though. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't. No. Yep. Oh, well, we'll move right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> wow, at first I thought you were going to incorporate them together, but it doesn't yeah. look like that. So we'll finish up the first one. Um, so motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, flashing signage for Guptill Road. Um, all those in favor say aye. It's, it's more aye. than that. It's the signing for the... The package for yep. the... Yeah. Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, now on to the Stowe Street motion. And made in and seconded to uh, also approve that uh, package when it's completed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Alrighty, so I guess we're going to have a little discussion on uh, whether or not to change the, to a fiscal year uh, and also talk about quarter, quarterly tax billing. Yeah, so uh, this is on the agenda at the request of uh, Mark Mateo. Uh, he brought this up um, right after our meeting as something that was uh, in his mind to, to talk about. He also mentioned that uh, potential charter for the town at that time. But he called last week and asked that we put this on the agenda. So it's under manager's items, but I'm going to defer to Mark at this point and then answer any questions. So Carla can comment as the town treasurer as well. So. OK, thank you. Um, when we had talked earlier, this was part of the dream list stuff we had at the beginning of our <clears throat> our terms here. And uh, this is an item that uh, Bill uh, mentioned does not require a charter change. It's simply a matter of, of having something proposed to the voters and then having the voters uh, uh, approve. Um, I guess as a community, we've got the latitude to do that. So all I'm looking for is just a temperature check on this. Um, I don't lose any sleep one way or the other with it. I think. There, there are some advantages to it. Uh, the biggest thing for me is just, um, one, being able to vote on your budget before it's actually underway and uh, approve what it is you're spending on. Bill has mentioned there are some advantages to being in the calendar year with respect to being able to close out and knowing what you've actually expended. So it's a six of one, half dozen another. Uh, the, with respect to the quarterly tax billing, it's just a matter of evening out the cash flow for the community <coughs> so we don't find ourselves in the position needing to borrow money in order to meet our bills during the course of the year. The other advantage that I can see with it is that um, as much as all of us enjoy paying our tax bills, instead of having two big ones, um, You've got it broken down into uh, quarters. Um, so you pay more frequently, but you pay less. But it all adds up. So like I said, it's, it's not uh, uh, something that I've lost a whole lot of sleep over, but I wanted to see as a board if there were feelings one way or the other for this. And if there was, then it becomes the technical question of approaching this as um, perhaps a survey question in conjunction with the general election process to offer us some guidance from uh, the voters with respect to what they may want to see and then uh, addressing it as, as an item at town meeting. Um, but others here have more experience in that than I do. So I guess my first question is, what does that do to town meeting bill and as far as the budgeting and approval and all that? Well, as Mark said, um, it really just changes the time frame, the frame of reference in terms of what you're, what you're approving. Town meeting would stay uh, the first Tuesday in March, just like it is now. Uh, but as opposed to uh, approving a budget for the calendar year January 1st, 2019, let's say, through December 31st, 2019, 
you'd be approving a budget from July 1st of 19 through June 30th of the following year. So um, it, it's, a, it's a couple of step process to get there. First of all, um, you know, Mark's idea about um, a, a non-binding referendum, if you will, that can be held in conjunction with the general election. I let Carla speak to that, whether that feels good to her or not. Um, you don't have to do that. The town would have to warn it either at a special or the annual town meeting. And except for the special town meeting that we had in January of this year to talk about the police, most special town meetings are rather ill attended. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having it at the, the question at town meeting would be the time to do it. So if, the, if you voted in March of 2019 to go to a July 1st fiscal year, it wouldn't start until July 1st, 2020 would be as early as you could incorporate it. And probably what you would do at town meeting 2020 is approve an 18 month budget. You'd approve a budget from January 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2021. So that first budget is a little bit, that's the biggest kind of stretch of time that you'd have to go go through. Um, but the town would have to vote to do it, and uh, if they voted to do it, the next budget year would be the first time it could be put into place. So uh, this could not happen unless you had a special time. You could have a special town meeting in a month and do it for next July. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I think you would not have a very broad cross-section of people at that meeting. Um, so sticking on the budget for a minute, the, the pros and cons of that. Um, the biggest pro, the biggest advantage is, as Mark said, you're approving a budget that's going to start in the future. So when we're at town meeting, we've already been through eight or nine weeks mm -hmm. of a budget before we approve a budget. So it would be nice to be able to approve a budget before it started. Um, as a corollary to that, you can't have tax collections on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis unless you move to a fiscal year of July 1st or unless you changed your charter and had some other fiscal year because the grand list doesn't get set until June and uh, you set the tax rate in July and that would all be the same. And now we have to collect our taxes between July 1st and December 31st. We've got to collect our taxes in the year that they're due uh, unless they're going to be delinquent. So if you move the fiscal year to July 1st, the listers would still get you the grand list in, in June like they do now. They would wait for the state the first week of July. They'd tell us the school tax, which is the school tax from July 1st to June 30th. Um, and then we would set the municipal tax rate and would send tax bills. And the earliest you could collect taxes would be about a month after July. So in early to mid-August would be the first due date, just like it is now. Mm -hmm. But then you could have quarterly or monthly billings if, if you wanted to. Um, the biggest downside that I see to moving to a fiscal year is that um, a couple of your biggest budget items are calendar year budget items. So. Um, Personnel is our biggest expense, and one of the bigger expenses, part of a personnel budget, is health insurance. Health insurance runs January 1st to, to uh, December 31st. You can work with an insurance company if you're large enough and go out. If you had over 100 employees, you could go to Blue Cross and you could, or Cigna, and ask them to uh, 
quote you insurance on a July 1st to June 30th basis. It's, you have the ability to do that, but we're, we're a small enough municipality that we have to go through the exchange, and that's a, a January 1st budget. So if we move to a, a June, uh, a July 1st fiscal year, um, in that budget year, we would know in November of, let's move forward, in November of 2019, we would know what our uh, costs are gonna be through uh, December of the next year, but we don't know what they're gonna be from that January to the end of June. So is there gonna be a 5% increase, a 25% increase, you don't know that. Um, the same thing happens with uh, our property and casualty, unemployment, workers' compensation, uh, That's insurance. all through DLCT. That's all through DLCT. And those are all on a calendar year basis as well. So those two pretty significant uh, budget items, you'd know, you'd have a, a good handle on half a year's worth, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know you'd have to estimate the second year's worth. Whereas now, we get our renewal for property and casualty workers' comp. We get that renewal in late November or early December, and I just plug it in, and we know what that cost is gonna be. Same thing with health insurance. Um, you have to project out further with the, the, fiscal, the July 1st fiscal year. Right now, you know, we, we, by the time the select board is uh, approving a budget to go to town meeting, we know what we spent for fuel, for instance, for the highway department. We kind of know what's happening. Uh, and we only have to project from January to December. Whereas if we go to a fiscal year, you, you know what it is now. But again, you're, you've got to project out 18 months almost before your, the end of your budget year. Because it would still be putting the budget together in January, and you'd have to be projecting expenses in May and June of a year later. So um, it, it can be done. A lot of times do it. Um, I would say probably, I, I don't know this, but my guess is there's probably 60, 70 percent of Vermont towns have moved to a, a July 1st fiscal year. All the schools do it because they are in lockstep with the state budget, which is, uh, you know, the this, this state budget is a July 1st year. Nobody's in step with the federal government. They have an October 1st fiscal year. Um, so anyway, it can be done, and probably of the, you know, medium to large sized towns, my guess is that the percentage of towns our size, uh, probably much higher percentage of them have those um, July 1st fiscal year budgets. So it's a little less exact. We know, as Mark said, right now when we, we don't have an audit finished by the time we go to town meeting, but we have a pretty good handle on whether we have a deficit or a uh, positive fund balance that we can bring forward or have to make up for in the, in the current budget year. So I think the numbers in terms of the budget are much more, they're much closer, much, you know, uh, they're closer to reality than uh, projecting out 18 months. Um, but as I said, other towns do. So how, how would you acquire the taxes for the 18-month budget and still based on the current uh, tax dates we have right now um, if we didn't switch through this process to something like quarterlies or whatever uh, we would have to uh, collect the money in two payments basically now for for the first 18 months yeah, we'd have, we'd have an 18-month budget. There's, some towns adopt a six-month budget mm -hmm. and then a 12-month budget. I don't know how they do that because I don't know how they can send their tax bills within their six-month period. If we 
had an 18 month budget, I think what we would end up doing is just collecting that 18 months worth of taxes in the 12 month period from July 1st of the first year it starts to the to the uh, June 30th of of that second year. You 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 combine it all yeah. and yeah. you just collect it in in a, a year. So your taxes that first year are going to be higher than they would be going forward. You hope half a, half again is right. You, you you would hope that you would have um, that. There might be some tendency to for the public to fall off the wagon on with that, you know, uh, staring them in the face. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about all that completely, but I think that's what we would end up doing. You'd, you'd have a budget that goes from January 1st, 2020 to June 30th of 2021, would set the grand list and set the tax rate in July of 2020, and then in the next 12 months, you'd collect it. So yeah, you'd have that one year, you'd have taxes that would have a premium in it. Um, I could see that as a hardship on somebody with a fixed income, you know, as a just an unexpected extra bill. Right. Yeah. So um, switching to quarterlies, you know, kind of jumping ahead here a little bit. If we switch to quarterly, can I, or can I ask one like, question before we oh, move sure. on to that? Yep. Bill, in terms of say one to ten, how important, in your opinion, it is to consider doing this change in fiscal year? Where do you land on that? I think I look to you almost as I, it sounds like it's just kind of creating more headache than maybe it's worth. I understand the yeah, pros. Yeah, I mean, team, but. you know, I've been I've been working on the January 1st cycle my whole career in Vermont. I've never worked for a town that was on a July 1st fiscal year. So every year, you know, starting about Thanksgiving, right through the end of January, you've been through the budget times and you know that we meet every week. That would still have to happen. I mean, we still have to be ready for, for March. Um, for me, um, I think because of the ability to project more accurately, I feel more comfortable that our budget is what we need it to be, as opposed to, okay, well, I know what six months of the health insurance is gonna be, but I don't know what the last six months are gonna be, and you've gotta, you've gotta fudge that a little bit. So from my perspective, if it were left to me alone, I would just keep it as is. Um, it's been a number of years, uh, and Mark wasn't on the board, but maybe he was at some town meetings. I mean, we have had some town meetings where people get up and, and complain about, you know, we've got two tax due dates, one is in August and the other one's in November, and, and you know, those are awfully close together, and, you know, taxes are getting higher. I'd like to spread it out a little bit. My response has always been, well, we can't have anything other than what we do now. Um, we could have monthly bills between July and December if you wanted to, but that's still, you're, you're still paying your full year's worth of taxes in a, in a six month period. Um, we can't do anything other than that unless we change the fiscal year. But I've also told people that We'll take your taxes anytime you want. If it's easier for you to pay your taxes quarterly or monthly, if you want to bring them in and you know estimate it, you know come in in April and and pay what you think is 25 percent. You come in June and pay 25 percent. Then we'll send you a bill and then you can balance it between <coughs> August and and uh, November. You're welcome to do that. Every year we get a few people that pay their taxes in advance. Um, uh, last year, because of the federal tax law change, there was a lot of people that did it. So we're more than happy to accommodate people. We put people on payment plans all the time if they're in arrears. But most people don't like to pay in advance unless they know what, what their bill is. So um, I think from staff's perspective, doing it the way we do it, is preferable. Um, maybe Carla can speak a little bit to the collection efforts because um, 
that happens out here in the, in the building. I mean, I'm involved to a small degree, but um, my involvement is pretty much checking the, the balance sheet uh, a couple of times a month just to make sure that we have enough money in the bank to pay our bills. But maybe we can speak Sure. To so both the collection of water, utility billing, and tax uh, income is very labor intensive. So water, we send out maybe around 1,000 bills four times a year. And then we do collections four times a year. And pretty much with both the utility and taxes, it's all hands on board for both the billing and the collection. Taxes, of course, is one billing in July, two collections, one collection in August, and one in November. So staff concern is that because it's so labor intensive, if you go to quarterly tax billing, uh, we double the effort, basically. And it really kind of impinges when staff can take family time or go on vacation because you have to be here. All four of us really need to be here when all these billing and collections are happening. You know, we could, we could uh, you know, the, the water and sewer, which is the Edward Ferrer Utility District's business, the select board doesn't have anything to do with water and sewer billing. Uh, you know, those, those buildings are based on meter readings. So the water department um, staff goes out four times a year, reads the meters, uh, brings that in. Karen King in, puts it into the system, generates a bill. So we actually uh, generate four bills a year and mail four bills a year and then have four collection dates. And it is very labor intensive. On the tax side, we could do what we do now. We could bill once a year, and instead of sending uh, two stubs, we could send four stubs. So it's more the collection. it doesn't have to be uh, you know, four billings for the taxes. Uh, but Carla is right in terms of the collecting of taxes. I mean, you'd be amazed, um, and it seems in, in direct proportion you know, the, the, the older that our um, taxpayers are, the closer to the billing date they pay their, their tax bill. You know, nobody wants to die owing the town any money. So we send out those bills in July, and they're here the next week, and they're paying it, you know. Whereas other folks like us are waiting until the very end. To, the escrow companies wait until right. three days before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for... For there's no question that staff prefers to leave it as is, but we also understand that we're here to um, to do the public's bidding, and if the public really feels that quarterly billing would be much more palatable, then you know we would, we would do what we have to do. And you know everybody understands that uh, the, the public makes the decisions. Um, but it is a little bit challenging. And, you know, when the tax bill, there's one time a year where the taxes and the water bills, well, twice a year, but they're pretty close, right? August, November. Yeah, both of those months. So. Yeah. So the, uh, the question, just to follow on with that, because I know um, you've been able to um, do the borrowing between the different governmental entities and haven't had to borrow commercially for uh, covering the payments, but when you do, what, what sort of process is involved with that and what kind of uh, interest do we occur, incur with that? Yeah, we, we've, uh, for good, bad, or indifferent, since Irene, we haven't had to borrow in anticipation of taxes to any great degree. Um, and I think, you know, I, uh, it's not because of Irene, but I think what happened was around the same time as Irene was hitting, our reserve funds were, were maturing. Um, when I first came here, you know, the town had fund balances at the end of the year, you know, it might be $30,000, and that was, that was a big balance. And, and we, we didn't have $4 million budgets at the time. We had, you know, a million and a half or $2 million budgets. But we could not uh, make it through the year without having to borrow because 
95% of our revenue is tax revenue, and we don't get it until eight months into the, almost nine months into the year. It's, you know, middle of August before we really see that money start to roll in. And in those days, um, it was advantageous to actually borrow all the money up front. And, you know, the earlier you could borrow it and the later you could pay it, uh, made most sense, and we were able to work it out some years that we were borrowing money in anticipation of taxes as early as the middle of January, and we were paying it back um, the middle of December. And we did that then because we were borrowing for 4%, um, but we were able to put it in the bank at 5.5%, and, mm -hmm. and you couldn't make money after 1986. Before 1986, it was legal to, to actually make money through arbitrage. But, um, you know, you were able to use your earnings to offset your borrowing expenses. Um, and you have to, you know, when you're going to do that, you have to go through a process and you've basically got to estimate your, your expenses every month and you have to estimate your income every month. and what they would do, the bank would look at your largest cumulative deficit and then add the next month's uh, expenses to that, and that's how much you could borrow. Um, then in the mid-90s, we started to uh, set money aside into capital improvement funds. And because that money was kind of cycling through, we didn't really invest that. We weren't investing that for long term. We were just investing it in money markets or maybe CDs. And at the same time, in the 90s, we got the money from Duxbury for the tax stabilization fund when they bought into the school. And a portion of that was always kept in cash. So as time has gone on, we have uh, developed more reserve funds. Uh, a year or two after Irene, the Library Center Cemetery Association went away, and they turned over $100,000 to us. We invested most of it, but we keep some of it in cash. Two years ago, we got the Hope Cemetery money. Um, it's in trust for the cemeteries, but it's in our single checking account. Yeah. So now we have these reserve funds built up, which provides us a amount of cash, and when we've had to borrow, it's been uh, minimal, you know, $50,000 here, $25,000 there, and because the village has a fair amount of cash on hand, rather than pay the People's United Bank, we pay the village, keep the money local. So uh, we haven't had to do a lot of uh, tax anticipation borrowing because of those two facts. We we have much more money in reserve than we did before. Um, it used to cost us up to $30,000 a year. That's 15, 20 years ago that we were paying in uh, interest, interest for uh, tax anticipation borrowing. I think the last couple of years I've budgeted 5,000 and I don't think we've used it. Um, so. So that's, uh, so I guess to summarize it from my point of view, the quarterly payments, Carla explained the reason that I knew that it wouldn't be favorable. Um, Bill just explained to us that, you know, there's enough defense mechanisms in place to, I think, cover our butts on having to uh, borrow on tax anticipation. Um, and then there's, I guess, my feeling about uh, the current budget system that we have in place and the fact that, you know, we, f we figure our budget. Uh, we don't really have a budget from January to, to uh, December, but we don't have an actual approval of the budget till town meeting. And I'll be honest with you, in my head, I think to myself, because I've heard it mentioned a few times that I know from the highways uh, department, there's there's a reluctance to spend until there's a budget approval, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing. I mean, we do what we have to do 
to cover our butts and, and, and spend what we have to spend, but there's a reluctance, I think, uh, part of the, the departments to hold off until town meeting, and I think that that has some fiscal benefit to it, you know? What's that? It dampens the spending. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like anybody that's fiscally responsible. You'd like to buy something, but until you get the paycheck in your pocket, you're going to hold off, and I think that has helped us overall uh, in, a, in, the, in the year cycle uh, kind of keep our budgets a little bit tighter. Um, and it, I kind of wish I could have had my wife come down here tonight, because obviously being the bookkeeper for 35 years, I can tell you her <laughs> response to this, and it would have been no way in hell. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons that she decided to jump ship uh, for fear of that, because there's other things that are involved in changing over that she knows yep. about that she didn't want any part of. So um, to Mark's point, I guess, I mean, um, I'm happy the way things are. Uh, the, the, only, the only question for me is whether or not you feel it's anything you want to get input from the voters on. That's as simple as I can be with it. Yeah. I, um, I don't have a particular ax to grind with it. I've heard discussions. Um, I've been part of communities where this process has taken place, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a hiccup for a little bit of time, but then it, it smooths out. And the, the bigger issue was, was really the expense that communities were running into having to borrow in anticipation of taxes. Um, and you know, right now things are fine, and maybe now is not the best time. Um, but again, the question for me is whether or not we want to ask the voters what their input is, which is uh, what we talked about earlier, the uh, non-binding referendum of one sort or another, just to get a temperature check on that. But um, even with that, I mean, that's, that's extra work. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll stick to the same. I, I'm not hearing enough concern or requests for that. I think it's confusing to a lot of people that don't sit on these boards, especially the fiscal year change. I, it seems like it's been working. I mean, the only, the one little thing that I might comment on is that, you know, Bill's been here a long time, and and a lot of the staff has too, so they understand how to, to, to run it, how we're doing it. One day Bill's gonna move on and I don't know if that's a risk that we take if similar sized towns, we're gonna have to replace Bill and potentially the person coming in isn't used to that. And is that something that we should be thinking about and concerned with, especially if there's a two year delay on, on something like this. So that's the only thing I can really think of that potentially might trigger this in my mind. Other than that, I really don't like the quarterly tax thing. Um, but the, the fiscal year change, I get why you would do it, but I, I really don't feel like it's come to a head enough to, to really make that change. And I think that um, in terms of taking the public's temperature, I'm a little concerned about the non-binding referendum. Um, people are gonna come in to vote in November. They're gonna be given something that they really don't know anything about if they don't read the newspaper or whatever, uh, they're going to maybe be asking questions that you know uh, will take up time. I think that it would be, if you want to take the public's temperature, it's better to do it as a simple question on the town meeting warning. And I know that you don't get as many people as you're going to have voting in the general election in the fall. But I think it's a much more informed discussion. People can ask questions. You can answer the questions. You know, so if you want to talk about it, I would, I would talk about it at town meeting with the understanding that this is just advisory. We're not asking you to really do this. We're just asking if you want us to consider doing it. Sort of like in the old days, we used to put on there, shall the voters direct the select board to appoint a merger committee mm. to 
talk about merger. And they would always say, yes, let's, yeah. uh -huh. let's have a committee to talk about merger. And they'd appoint people, and people would do a lot of work, and then they would always say, no. No. So, <laughs> anyway. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both Chris and Mark's comments, and I think a lot of I think a lot of people um, are, are just barely hanging on in this town right now, and I think any um, any reason for them to think that their tax burden is going to change, even if it's if it's just a timing thing, would be enough to send them into a panic. Mm -hmm. I know Duxbury went through it here just a couple of years ago because we got caught up in it, my wife and I, because we get property over there. But uh, um, and they were on the hook for 18 month bill, and you know, yeah. I mean, they made it through it, but they don't have, you know, I, I, I'm sure there's probably some properties over there that carry a pretty good tax burden, but uh, I'd have to think there's more in this town of that size. You know. Um, okay. We can we could talk about whether or not we wanted to ask the question at town meeting at a yeah we can talk yeah. about later date. Talk about so. that. Okay. And get closer to town meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, last item of the year is an emissions issue. Yeah. So um, Dan Sweet has written the select board a letter and he apologizes that he wasn't able to really write it until today. Um, the listers met and uh, there were there's three properties um, <clears throat> where they're recommending that you agree that the grand list should be changed they will all lower the grand list um, and thereby lower the amount of tax revenue that we take in if everybody paid all at once but in the grand scheme of things they're very uh, minimal there's two properties, one Cobb Hill Holdings LLC, which was a mobile home on land owned uh, by Waterbury Equity Partners, and that was up on Hill Street, High Street. Yeah. And then the other one, um, Gary Sweetser, uh, same, same land, same area. The first mobile home uh, would, what he did, those mobile homes were removed a year ago. And uh, Dan <clears throat> forgot to remove them from his working grand list. So when he adopted the grand list this year, the, the, the grand list that he works on all the time contained them. Bills went out, and the properties don't even exist there anymore. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of no-brainers. The first one reduces the grand list by $6,500. The second one reduces the grand list by $3,600. So about $10,000 between the two of them, and you know the tax impact is minimal, nominal. Um, Waterbury Commons LLC, this is Paul Arnott's land up on uh, Perry Hill, and uh, Dan realized that um, the common land, the land owned by the Homeowners Association, was not taxed, so he, added that to the grand list and taxed it at $43,000 for um, uh, that, that common land. <laughs> um, Mr. Arnott appealed to the listers, and when Dan did a little research, he realized that none of the other um, properties that have common land to it, Harvey Farm, uh, Meadowcrest, Meadowcrest None of that common land is yes. taxed. So in order to be fair to the folks that live in Arnott's development, he's recommending to remove the $4,300 that he added this year, but then the listers will look at the common land in all of these other developments for next year to see if they should be taxed. So um, this is a, could be a one-year reprieve, but it puts him or it leaves Arnott and the people at Waterbury Commons on the same footing that everybody else is on. One, one, one question with this. You first said 43,000, and then you said 4,300. No, it's stop. It's stop. 43,000, okay. That's the appraised value? Yeah, so the, um, they had listed the value um, 
The list is set to determine that the common land should be assessed in tax, but the assessment should occur across all properties that incorporate such land and not target to one landowner. The original assessment was 343,000. This change removes the common land assessment of 43,000 from the grand list and makes the value 300,000. So how does that work um, on a piece of common land? Is it still... I don't know. <laughs> so, so I think what he did was that in this case, um, because of all the lots haven't been sold up there, mm -hmm. I think Arnott is still the title holder to the common land yeah. until all the lots get sold. And then when they're all sold, then they all become owners of that common land, and I assume they get divided on a pro rata basis, but right now we haven't been taxing anybody. Right, so my question was, on a piece of common land, is it a series of pieces of everybody's lot that makes up the common land, or is it just yeah. a separate? No. Mm -mm. no. In Meadowcrest, it's, it's a separate 23 acres. Completely separate That's piece that the yeah. Homeowners Association owns? Yes. And buys insurance on and maintains. Okay. And is that common land also in like current use or? No. There's no. In some scenarios, is the common land part of the permit to build non developable at that point? I think it's non developable. I believe that's correct. So if it's just got to drive the value of it down to. Right. So the value is not going to be as high as it would be. Right. You know, if it's. 23, how many acres? 23, matter of fact. Yeah, if it's 23 <coughs> acres and it's not developable, then, you know, the value wouldn't be very high. Anyway. So they even sell it? They couldn't sell it, right? Like the, huh? They can sell it, right? Like, could the it's association funny. sell it? Yeah. I don't, it's it's yeah, I don't know how this. <laughs> well, I suppose. I, think that I don't know. It depends on how the deed it. reads, you know? But, I mean, you would think that they could sell it to an adjacent landowner who, yeah. I think they with restrictions or something. Right. So the bottom line for now is that he wants to treat this property right. sure. as every place else is treated. And then he and the listers are going to look at it to see whether common land should be taxed. And if so, take into consideration all these questions. Yeah. Yeah. And we may get to this point next year and they say, well, he may say, well, there's a good reason Tom Vickery never assessed any value to it because it really doesn't have much value. Well, yeah. if that's the way it works out, that it doesn't get taxed because it's in common land, I got some land I'm putting in common land. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's the question, right? So it almost would suggest that if you were to split a parcel and do a project like this, you would make the lot smaller with the idea that you pay tax on a small footprint, but you get use of a significant right. amount of land without getting taxed on so it, I, which I is... Think and I think right. this is, as Carla said, these are all the angles that Dan wants to look at. Because we want to treat everyone fairly, and everyone should pay their fair share. Yeah. So for right now, so right now you, right. the select board, I would recommend make a motion to approve the reductions to the grand list as suggested in the report of errors and omissions on the 2018 grand list submitted by the Watery Board of Listers. So moved. I'll second that. And if... Yep. So, with further discussion, Ann, you had a okay. comment? Okay. Originally, uh, Countryside was, I think that was the first PUD, Planned Unit Development. And I was on the Planning Commission Board at the time. So the deal was that in a PUD, there are setbacks from the property line that you cannot build on. That's one thing. The other was, for an example, a homeowner had two acres on which to build, but he owned that other 18 acres so that initially technically he had 20 acres but of that 18 was common land now how do you want to figure out how how to tax it you know i right. well, i think he has to i think well, he has to look at the covenants because our covenants say 
on our common land, even on your own property, you can't cut anything down that's smaller than three inches or something. I don't know. There's all kinds of restrictions mm. on the that, land. That's, that's within the covenant of the homeowners right. association. Right. But it's, it's not necessarily what the zoning BUD says. Mm. Well, maybe when we get to that point, uh, of evaluating those, maybe Dan could come in and explain sure. it to us all and whatnot so we get a better understanding. So a motion has been made and seconded. Uh, I don't see any reason anybody want any further discussion. All those in favor then, let's say aye. 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 Okay, motion to adjourn. Uh, you all need to sign that down. So moved. So uh, Hang before on. you adjourn, before you adjourn, um, I asked last week, when you were going to meet on the 20th, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be on vacation. So I don't mind it all. I'll keep it up, believe me. But I guess we can see what comes up. Right, that's what I really suggest. Not much yeah. not being right now, right? Nothing. So the, the meeting would be on the 3rd, the next one? It would be the Tuesday after. Mm -hmm. Oh, 4th. Labor Day. Yeah, 4th. Yeah, unless anything major comes up. Right. So why don't we say the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September 4th, and if something comes up and we need to be more like a month. Okay. All righty. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Your second? My second. Okay.